In this video, we're going to describe some fundamental principles, the big picture of sample size calculations, and then we'll drill down into more detail later on. Think with me for a minute about uh, the possibility of doing a census. If we spoke to every caretaker of every child, then we would know precisely what proportion of the kids had been vaccinated. There would be no error at all. The margin of error would be zero. But that's not how we do things. We do a sample, we do a survey, based on a sample, and uh, we have an estimate of the proportion who've been vaccinated. Let's say maybe that estimate is 79%. But if we had visited different households or different clusters, or even the same households and clusters on a different day, we might have obtained a different estimate. We might obtain a number like 77% or 78% or 82%. The fact that the answer can vary a little bit based on what sample you take is called sampling variability or sampling error, or margin of error. And we often describe it in the results of our report using something called a confidence interval. So we might say that the estimated proportion of vaccinated kids was 92%, and the 95% confidence interval extends from 88 to 94%. By that, we mean that we are 95% confident that the true proportion in the target population is somewhere between 88 and 94%. Of course, to be helpful to the program, the vaccination program, the confidence interval should be quite narrow. We want to have a pretty good idea, a pretty precise estimate of where the true population coverage lies. Now, the good news is that we can make the estimate as precise as we want to. Theoretically, we can take a bigger and bigger sample and drive that confidence interval down to be more and more narrow. But the bad news is, to get a more precise estimate, you have to spend a lot more money. Here we illustrate that with some figures. This first figure shows uh, the width of the confidence interval shown in the shading here, the width of the 95% confidence interval based on the effective sample size. So if you interview 103 caretakers and 50% of them uh, say their child was vaccinated, then the 95% confidence interval would go all the way from 40% to 60%. If you do a bigger survey and interview 1,000, and again, half of them had been vaccinated. Now the confidence interval, or the margin of error, goes from about 47% to 52%. So more precision requires a bigger sample size. The same point is illustrated here. If it were 95% instead of 50%, these confidence intervals are not symmetrical. They're asymmetric. But the principle is the same, that as the sample size gets bigger, then the estimates get more precise. <coughs> So the three steps that are used to calculate the sample size for this type of cluster survey uh, about vaccination or any other topic really, is first to understand what margin of error is acceptable to the steering committee, the, the, the consumers of the, of the survey report. Second, to look up in a table or to use an equation to select, well, what number of respondents would we need then to, to have estimates that are that precise? Now, the equations and the tables are set up generally to give you an answer, a sample size, for using simple random sampling. But we're not going to use simple random sampling. We're going to use a cluster sample. So we have to inflate the simple random sample number to account for several different factors, to account for clustering, which makes the margins wider, and to account for uh, other factors that we'll discuss in some detail that might limit the number of completed interviews. So this is a standard three-step approach used uh, in many fields and all around the world. We use a slightly uh, uncommon method in step two that's better for our context. We'll describe that also in some detail later. But in the big picture, this is, a, this is the common approach, and this is what we'll be talking about this week. Here's the same thing displayed graphically. We're going to gather some inputs from the committee from the census office and survey professionals. We're going to ask what level of precision do they need and what are some of the factors in this country in context that might decrease our number of completed responses. And we'll use that to look up in some tables or calculate with equations the effective sample size. That's the number we would use if it were a simple random sample. And then what are the inflation factors? We'll multiply those things together to get a, an estimate of the target sample size. How many clusters do we need to go to? How many households do we need to visit? 
how many teams do we think it's going to take to do this job and how many days? And those are the, those are the figures that will feed forward to the budget team. So big picture, to summarize Annex B1, you need to work with the Survey Steering Committee to gather several important inputs, and then you use those inputs to look up or to calculate six values. These values have longer names, but our shorthand names for them are A, B, C, D, E, and little m. And then when, once you've gathered those values, you multiply them and divide them in ways that we will show you to calculate the important outcomes of the sample size calculation.